A very good evening, everybody who is watching us live on Facebook. After a very, very interesting uh, debate session with our students, we are now ready for our panel discussion on a very interesting topic, learning in the era of COVID-19 and thereafter. We are fortunate to have with us some eminent uh, personalities who will be talking about this very relevant topic in the current age. And uh, the best part about this panel is that we have the voices from various communities that are associated with school education and learning. So uh, right from a veteran educationist to a parent and to a student and industry experts, we are going to be looking, we are looking forward to this panel, which is going to be an amazing session. Um, without any further ado, let me introduce the moderator for this panel first. Uh, once again, uh, a warm welcome to Mr. Ananj Prasad, the founder and MD at Skillsphere Education. Uh, Ananj, uh, you know, like I always say, most of the people at Elpro know you and your organization. But uh, for for the because of the love that I have for you and the school, uh, what it is for you, let me just uh, quickly introduce you once again to our audiences. Uh, Anash is a gold medalist graduate from Mumbai University and from there on he went on to pursue his master's in energy economics at the Ivy League Cornell University USA. Thank God for his passion uh, towards uh, skill set orientation in young students. He founded Skillsphere Education in the finest and largest skill based organization. Anansh, with his stream of trainers, have uh, been associated with the school for seven years, and they run various programs which are conceptualized by Anansh himself, uh, like Enlighten MUN, Lead, Emergence, and Global Jigyasa. He is also the brain behind curating this entire event for eQuest, and uh, is very is instrumental in uh, a lot of initiatives that the school takes in honing these skills for our young learners. So Anansh, the platform is all yours. Please introduce our panelists. Thank you so, so much, Suganda, ma'am, for your kindness as always, for Elpro International School's kindness as always. And it is a pleasure to be a part of such an event. And it's absolutely a pleasure to be a part of this panel discussion with a very August gathering online at this juncture. We're going to have a fabulous panel discussion. And the reason it's going to be even better is that we have stakeholders from all sections of the educational ecosystem providing and presenting their views and ensuring that we have one of the most fulfilling experiences. So without much ado, let us first introduce our panelists because I think it's only fitting you know their perspectives or the perspectives they're going to come from. So we'll start off with our senior most panelist today, a veteran educationist who we are absolutely honored to have with us on the panel today, Dr. Sumer Singh. Uh, to give you a brief about sir, Dr. Sumer Singh was the head of Daily College and director of Daily, Business, Daily College Business School Indore and Lawrence School Sanar, and also served as founder director of the Asian School. Over the years, he has served as advisor education in the government of Punjab, as chairman of the Indian Public Schools Conference, IPSC, a very prestigious group of schools, some of the oldest and best schools like Daily College Indore being a part of it, as trustee and advisory on the executive of Round Square UK, another very great organization, great group of schools, and is currently serving on the boards of World Leading Schools Association, AFS India, Punjab Public School Nava, Uni Variety, and Indoor, in, and Indoor Management Association. Phew. That is a lot of wonderful organizations to be a part of. He is also an advisor to some of the most famous veteran schools like Mayo College Girls School and many more. He received an honorary doctorate of literature and education from De Montfort University, UK. A highly experienced professional with a proven record, he brings with him passion and foresight. As a mentor, he will be a key contributor bringing about qualitative change in academic excellence. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumer Singh, for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. And uh, please don't forget to mention I'm also involved with your school, Elpro. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think that's also a very important facet. We are so glad, sir, that uh, you're involved with Elpro International School, Chinswad. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And we look forward to receiving wonderful insights from you during the panel discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Let's move on to Dr. Mohit Dube, an alumnus of Australia India Youth Dialogue AIYD 2015, a tier two level think tank of young leaders under 40 years from India and Australia. Dr. Mohit Dube has an overall global experience of more than 19 years. He is currently the CEO of Atal Incubation Center at MIT ADT University Pune. It's a Section 8 company supported by Atal Innovation Mission, AIM, Niti Aayog, Government of India to promote innovation and entrepreneurship across India. Dr. Mohit Dube, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you and glad to be here. Looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Likewise, sir. Thank you so much. Let's move on to Mr. Aditya Shamsher Malla. Mr. Aditya Malla is the general manager of Double Tree by Hilton Pune, Chinswad, an industry veteran with more than two decades in the business. Mr. Malla has been a part of global brands such as Marriott International, Hyatt Hotels, Oberoi Hotels and Resorts, Starwood Hotels and Resorts, Shangri La International, and Taj Hotels, Resorts and Palaces. Mr. Malla is a parent of a senior student studying in class 12 at Elpro International School. He is also an alumnus of IMT Ghaziabad, Delhi University, and IIM Bangalore, where he has pursued various degrees right from a BA in Honours in Economics at Delhi University to an Executive Education Program in Strategic Management of Luxury and Lifestyle Business at IIM Bengaluru. Thank you so much, Aditya sir, for joining us. We look forward to your insights today. Thank you. My pleasure and honour. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. We move on to Ms. Swati Mehta. Ms. Swati Mehta is the Marketing Director at Innovation Entertainment. She is an extremely creative and enthusiastic individual with 10 years of experience in international marketing, communications, and event management. Currently, she is a hands-on mother to a seven-year-old boy who, as she says, keeps her on her toes. She loves spending time with her son during various skill set building activities with him and is actively involved in planning and executing com community events at the school. She's based out of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Swati ma'am is going to provide us very interesting insights with respect to online learning in the era of COVID for a seven-year-old child, and that too, not in India, but in KL, Malaysia. Thank you so much, Swati ma'am, for joining us all the way from Malaysia. I hope uh, we are able to do justice to your presence today. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you so much for having me, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. All right, ma'am. Uh, let's move on to Ms. Maya Menon. With a teaching experience for 10 years, Ms. Maya mentions cognitive and social growth. She was actively involved in educating the underprivileged children. She believes in combining strong passion for English and writing expertise to motivate and inspire children with an aim to create a fun and challenging learning environment. An extremely affable teacher, she often shares with her students the motto of live and let live. Maya ma'am, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sure you're going to provide the insights of the fun, the trials, the tribulations, and the exciting challenges associated with being a teacher in the era of COVID-19. Absolutely, and it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this panel discussion. Thank you so much for those kind words too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya ma'am. And last, but definitely, definitely not the least, Atharva Shitole. He is a 17-year-old enterprising student who is passionate about debating and discussing several geopolitical issues. He is a firm believer in youth leadership and hopes to be the voice of tomorrow. Atharva, from the student fraternity at Elpro International School, here to provide his insights on what it really is to be studying via Microsoft Team and Zoom. Atharva, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, sir. It's a privilege to be here. All right, so as all of our audience members on Facebook can see, we have a very diverse panel with us, and I'm sure they represent every section of the educational ecosystem and their views on this burning question of learning in the era of COVID-19. Without much ado, let's jump into the panel discussion. And if you could start off with Sumer Singh, sir. Sir, what are your views? Uh, you have seen it all. I mean, I, I don't think it would be an understatement to say that, uh, you know, you have seen it all over the years. You have seen education transform from purely offline, non-digital learning to uh, a perfect integration of digital learning into educational systems. And today you see only digital learning taking place. So I'm sure you have seen the entire gamut of uh, learning systems that exist. And what is your view on the current situation in COVID-19? Do you think, uh, this is a burning question that a lot of parents actually ask. Do you really think learning is taking place via Zoom or Team? 
So I think uh, the topic is very uh, well selected because uh, learning is what you have emphasized on, not teaching. Right. And uh, I think this is actually an era, again, a word that you have used, which is a sustained long period. Uh, and it is something which is knocked off a year of most students' formal education. Uh, so it is something that really needs to be uh, looked at in a very serious manner. Uh, learning is definitely taking place. I think learning has been enhanced because students are now not only getting fantastic online services from the schools, but there are service providers who are providing content. There are service providers who are providing platforms. And they have all become more techn technologically savvy. Uh, this is giving them the opportunity to explore further beyond what is happening in the academic sphere. And therefore, they are getting the kind of well-informed general knowledge on topics which interest them. Once this habit forms of being able to explore beyond, the, beyond academics, it is not something that's going to stop. It's going to be something that gives them self-esteem, gives them self-confidence. And I think it is going to lead to a whole higher level of learning taking place in the schools tomorrow. The unfortunate part, of course, is, and I would like to just mention this, that 67% of our students in the country do not have access to online learning. And... Uh, this is something which is going to widen the gap. Education is supposed to narrow the gap between the haves and the have-nots, but this is going to, in fact, widen the gap. And I'm reminded of this story in Himachal Pradesh where a family living in a mud house, uh, not being able to afford to be able to give the children even a smartphone to small kids, uh, had to sell their only means of livelihood, a buffalo, for 6,000 rupees to get this phone to be shared by both the children. So it's a stark contrast between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, the students whom we are talking about are the fortunate ones in the 33%. And uh, even in the 33%, remember that many of the students, many of the schools, 50% uh, of the schools in the country are private schools, uh, are using only uh, WhatsApp for online learning. Now, that's not really a very satisfying uh, situation. On the other hand, I think this is a great opportunity because whenever the world has gone through any kind of natural or man-made disaster, uh, this is being called an act of God, uh, there is development that takes place, civilization moves ahead, there are solutions found, and uh, the same thing is happening here. The two areas in India which were lacking, lagging behind, one was healthcare and the other was education at the school level. And when I say education at the school level, I mean that many of the schools just went in for boring uh, lectures where teachers who were half uh, asleep had not upgraded themselves. Today, uh, both areas have really boomed. Healthcare has boomed. And uh, not just healthcare as an industry, but even the air that we breathe. And, and, and if you look at education, it's going to create a whole lot of people with initiative, entrepreneurs who are going to now blossom. So there is an upside to it. Most certainly, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing views on a range of perspectives, right from the fact that enhanced learning is taking place, students are learning new methods of uh, education or are getting exposed to them. You also talked about the unfortunate divide that exists with 67% of India students not having access to online learning. Uh, you also talked about other facets of the growth of the education and healthcare industry, new resources coming in. In fact, I would also like to talk about about, you know, the lack of uh, online learning for close to 67% of uh, India's youth. I would actually like to pose this question to Aditya Mala, sir, and would like you to share your views. Uh, sir, interestingly, very recently, uh, the Gujarat uh, Department of Education, and in fact, the Gujarat government, um, passed a very interesting statement. And as a parent, I would like to ask you this, sir. Uh, the Gujarat uh, 
the government actually stated that uh, online learning is not real learning so schools should probably uh, not charge fee of course the fee issues an altogether different issue but i would like to know from you sir you have a student in class 12 do you believe that online learning is not learning and i would be very happy if you provide your honest views on this first of all i'll uh, take this opportunity to thank the whole uh, teaching community uh, for what they're doing right uh, you know, if you look at the situation and just just step back a couple of months i would call it akin to an invasion right the situation was like an invasion which suddenly hit almost all of humanity and uh, among the other things that happened of course we had the doctors we had the administration that stepped up you must understand the teachers stepped up as the first line of defense in in, in many ways and uh, that took one of the biggest concern of parents like us uh, you know that that concern was just taken off our backs because the most important contribution that they made was uh that they upskill themselves almost to do that uh and you know really uh, totally commendable very very commendable job by all the teaching community across the world uh in india with all the constraints that we have spoken about uh the most important thing that i feel that my children got was they got continuity they continued their association and their connect with the institution that's next most important to them and sometimes more important to them than immediate family uh that that feeling of belongingness continued uh you know while this whole debate about the fees and how much and where they're not going to school for me that's a very secondary uh, situation because uh, most important was to see my children engaged my children engaged with the teachers who they are familiar with uh and the learning is not just about uh, in my view it's not about what you what you read in textbooks it's it's a lot of confidence it's a lot of the soft skills that teachers impart and you know i i i think i also speak on behalf of the teachers I, I, the teachers were delighted to be in touch with the students this whole relationship continued it didn't it didn't snap it didn't i mean it, we, we as organizations couldn't ensure that you know i was i was working very hard to stay in touch with my team members who were in remote corners of the uh, of the state and sometimes the country as well and uh, you know really uh, i i take this opportunity and and this forum to thank the teachers uh, for what they're doing and uh, really the fees part is 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 an altogether uh, different uh, perspective and learning is definitely going on learning is going on in more ways than one i would uh, also rate uh, as as dr sumer said uh, you know the upskilling part um you know both for teachers and uh, and for students you know students are still from the digital era in, in in more ways than one but look at the teachers and how they quickly they adopted adapted and you know it's a completely different skill set online education is a very different skill set and i can only imagine how much of effort and and even cost would have gone into getting the teachers to to upskill themselves and and continue the the teaching experience uh, for our for our children there is never a perfect situation the um, crisis uh, had to be dealt with and i think in in crisis what you do is you put your best foot forward and uh, really um, i'm i'm totally impressed with what what's going on in our country and i think this is an this is a this is an, shouldn't even be debated yes there is engagement there is learning there is familiarity there is um, a continuity above everything else thank you so much thank you so much uh, uh, aditya sir for actually sharing your views you've provided a very different perspective the perspective of a parent and i'm glad you've also highlighted the entire effort that teachers who have often been teaching for 30 years using whiteboards chalk dusters and probably a laptop to show a presentation have gone through in order to transition learning all together with all these different keys buttons uh, screen shares and muting students among other aspects in a very short duration of time it is definitely a lot of effort and thank you so much for talking about it in addition you talked about a very interesting point continuity in education which is an integral part of the entire process of learning teaching soft skill development in fact 
BBC had has come up with a very interesting article that I read a day back. You talk, they talked about how lost school time in economic terms might actually affect the United Kingdom for over 65 years. When you talk about it at multiple levels, when you go through all the levels, right from upskilling to growth to the middle years income of students being affected due to a gap year, there are going to be a lot of issues. Now, 65 years is, of course, an economic concept, but there are definitely going to be impacts of it. So the continuity of education being ensured is definitely a value addition for any parent or student. Dr. Mohit Dube uh, from the Atal Education Center, how do you see it? How do you see learning in the era of COVID-19 and the new opportunities that it has given to uh, Atal Incubation Center as well as entrepreneurs? Right, thank you, um, Anansh, uh, and thank you other speakers uh, for sharing their thoughts. Uh, but, but let me put this on record. This country has made this country. This country has not made this country. So we need to salute all the teachers who are who may not be called the frontline warriors right now, but they truly are the ones who are supporting those frontline warriors. This is not a small effort to keep a mammoth 1.5 million school children. There are around 15 lakh schools in this country. There are 739 districts in this country. There are 675,000 villages in this country. And despite this force, forced learning that we have been thrown into, please mind it. This is not something that we opted for. None of the parents, none of the teachers, no country opted for this. So when we, when we start thinking about uh, the migration from an offline to online learning, you know, we keep on, we keep on uh, uh, discussing about how quickly we moved on to the online bandwagon. But as uh, uh, Dr. Sumer Singh was kind of highlighting a, a tip of an iceberg of the problem that you are losing 67% of the country's uh, young, bright children uh, devoid of the learning that they could have got in the schools. When Zoom was banned from the Ministry of Defense, you know, they put together a challenge from the MIT, you know, the Ministry of Electronics and IT uh, to, to submit the proposal for India voice conferencing tool. And the challenge I tell you, when we started, I put startups to uh, uh, you know submit the proposal on that we were looking at creating a vc tool which sits on the india stack what is india stack it's jandan aadhar and mobile so just look at that whole technology revolution that has happened in this country for in the last decade if there was no aadhar we would not have dealt with this situation in the way the gracefully that india is dealing with if there was no accounting if there was no you know, bank accounts that were opened in the last 10 years uh, in this country, people would not have got their DBT transfers done. Had there been no penetration of these mobile markets, uh, we would not have seen uh, the, the response that this country is giving to this whole online learning that we call. And, and mind this, this is despite that 67% of the uh, community that uh, Dr. Sumer mentioned about. Now, you talked about... Uh, uh, the schooling part of it, right? I come from a hardcore banking background. You know, when we were in, in the early 2000s, when we were building applications for the banking community, there was a term called, we, we want banking, but we don't want banks. So they wanted a banking, but without these huge set of brick and mortar banks, because, uh, you know, it was kind of wasting their times when people used to walk into the bank and they had long queues you know, the, the age old people were going, you know, waiting and waiting and the kind of uh, torture they had, they, had, they had to undergo just to withdraw their own money. And that's how you, you started building a lot of these systems to reduce the dependency of the janta, arm janta on the banking infrastructure. But that was a, a well-planned activity. You know, the world moved from that brick and mortar banking towards removing the banks and started providing those banking opportunities. And that's why you, you built some phenomenal banking systems. And now, you know, you have these Paytms uh, who are just the payment banks kind of thing. So, so that whole two decade of that journey of removing the banks and, and providing the banking in the hands of the users took two decades. Now, just consider that same thing. Now, we are into that similar era where the, not just the country, please mind this, and, and that was an effort where the country wanted to migrate from the you know a bank to a banking kind of an environment. Whereas here, the entire world is caught up in the uh, this pandemic together. So there's no, no country in the world which can say we are safe, we are doing okay, we can provide support to the other guys, right? If 
if if some pandemic has occurred say in uh, uh, southeast asia uh, you know uh, other countries were still up and running so they could support that but this time this this pandemic has impacted everyone and that's where this whole opportunity of of building this whole technology layer and, and let me not mince any words the last draft educate the, the last education policy in this country was rolled out in 2005 and for last two years we are still debating in the next draft national education policy on the other day we had uh, dr kasturi rangarajan at at our uh, uh, show at mid ed and and he, he was fantastic in putting it together the pieces of the puzzles for this new draft education policy but look at the implementation the go to market that we talk about in the uh, you know in the in the startup world that itself has taken around 2 2 and a half years so if the policy at the government level itself is taken around 15 years to come up you know and and education mind it has been the most under invested domain as far as technology investments are concerned even today if you want if you ask me the best of the best indian institutions if i go and walk up to their data centers or the servers i can tear apart i i can do a ethical hacking right from my lab to whichever institution you tell me so that's the because that as a focus we were never trained to create that tech infrastructure to run these systems you know the immediate reaction that all of us went into was oh boss how do we migrate these classes from an on- offline to an online classes kind of mode and that's where you know people were kind of figuring out what are the free tools available the zooms and the teams and the go to meetings and so on and forth and docs have mentioned about the whatsapp method of uh, teaching as well you know nobody used whatsapp for teaching learning process right people were using whatsapp for sharing jokes and, and we thought the younger generation would increase their attention st- attention span with the uh, advent of technology right we were all wrong in the technology front right so we are we are looking at yeah. the era when we are saying how do we take this schooling as as for the next decade how do we build that schooling component when we are looking at that the physical uh, schooling a physical schooling will not be possible for the near foreseeable future so it's it's that moment of how do you see that the schooling can be built for next decade or two decades uh, and and how do you phase out these school infrastructures uh, from that whole scheme of things right right thank you so much sir so so talked about how we can actually complement the existence of existing schools infrastructures and slowly slowly transition into the next decades or three two decades of learning so thank you so much for actually uh, sharing your views with respect to that you know the new innovations that are taking place you drew analogies to the entire um, uh, the entire revolution that took place in banking and the revolution that many schools are instituting with respect to learning thanks to covid-19 so thank you so much for sharing your views swati ma'am you are the mother of a 7 year old child uh, a child who probably you know takes a little bit of time to ensure attention span even in offline schools how have you seen uh, the entire transition online and especially in malaysia Yes well I am a mother of a very boisterous 7 year old son so he he his attention span definitely is very less and um, well I'm really really glad and I'm happy that uh, the shift from um, the physical class to the online uh, happened just within a week and it was okay we did have our own learning curve and um, I mean the kids did take a bit of a time the teachers did take a bit of a time but that was just one week and that's commendable on their part and uh, you know I also feel that with the whole pandemic situation the whole lock lockdown that came i think it's it's also a story that we'll tell to our future generation that you know we were hit with a big problem we didn't stop there we didn't say oh schools are shut what should we do now we should stay home we can't do anything but we went forward we took out a solution and we all came up with it and we all did realize that okay there are certain hurdles but we need to overcome them we just can't sit down and say oh there is no school so you why don't we just do this and why don't we like you know do something else instead of that so that i definitely believe was a big learning for our kids and um, and yes i mean there is a lot of a difference in the physical school and uh, teaching online to a 7 year old especially to the primary section because the attention span is very less and it has to be almost like a homeschooling thing because Uh, we we did have a eight to three structured class online where we did have Zoom sessions with the teachers, which were almost about twenty twenty minutes to forty minutes. But when they were introducing new concepts, concepts in terms of 
in maths and in science, they would do their teaching and they would give us assignments. You can't expect a seven year old to just listen to a 20 minute lecture and do the assignment. So it had to be, it's more like a hand in hand uh, session with the teacher and the mother or the father sitting with the kid because the kid cannot take card printouts, he cannot fill things, he cannot take a picture, upload stuff and just send it across his assignments. So I feel that, um, I mean, it, it definitely must have been hard for parents who both were working and or probably who had more kids. Definitely it has been hard for them. But yeah, it was not like just the just the, the parents could do one thing. Yeah, it had to be together with teachers and parents. So do you believe it was an enriching experience for you to be a more active stakeholder in the learning process for your seven-year-old child? Because I'm sure you would also be an active participant in ensuring that those assignments were completed. You also had to be, you know, probably party to certain uh, sessions. Did that help you? Do you think yeah. that has also, uh, uh, you know... Definitely, definitely. I had to unlearn some concepts that I had learned when I was the kid to teach him something which is a bit more different now. So yeah, that happened and we realized how education has changed in the past 20 right. years. And, right. um, you know, I mean, in a, prime, in a primary student's life, we, we see that they've learned over a period of time. We can see their vocab has changed or maybe they know about counting and things, but we don't know what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. True. But when I was sitting with my son and I was attending the Zoom classes, I would see, okay, I could see some tangible things that he was doing. He was learning every day. Do you think this and, is sustainable? Um, if I might ask you... Do you do you sorry, think this is sustainable? I'm so sorry to cut you, but do you believe that this is going to be a sustainable outcome post COVID-19? Do you think, uh, you know, parents will be able to ensure this even when school transitions offline slash online offline? I think it depends. I cannot say yes or no. There's no fixed answer for it. It depends on uh, the course that you're doing A and B on the age of the child. Right, right, right. Yeah. So right. um, probably for a primary section, I think it has to go hand in hand. It cannot be just a physical class or just a Zoom class. And probably if somebody who's, who's doing a more technical course or probably like a like a senior kids, I think they are, of course, they're more disciplined. So they know that, you know, there's some sense of commitment. So they know yeah. that they have something, they've got a work to do and they would submit it. But I can't expect that kind of a commitment from a seven-year-old. Right, got it. Thank you so much, Swati, ma'am, for providing your views on this. Let's actually talk to the teacher in the panel discussion. Ma'am, I'm sure it's been, uh, you know, a uh, gargantuan task for you, uh, for every teacher. I absolutely respect every teacher. You know, there are teachers who I've spoken to who have been working for 30 years in the field and all of a sudden they have to move on to Zoom. They were not comfortable probably even using WhatsApp in certain cases, all the way, all the way up to Zoom. Uh, in a matter of five days, 10 days, 15 days, at max a month, everybody has had to be empowered. Uh, you know, um, this has also involved other facets and, you know, other experiences for teachers. At the end of the day, today, teachers are being judged way more than they would have ever been judged in an offline classroom because classes and sessions have now gone to living rooms, to bedrooms, to kitchens. And I am sure there is an added sense of pressure associated with that as well. And I'm sure that, you know, at times, parents might not be able to understand these trials and tribulations. That's just my perspective. Maya, ma'am, could you please shed light on your experience? Absolutely. And uh, I'd like to begin by saying that shutting schools down would have been an option, but shutting down learning is definitely not an option. And so we had to keep going as teachers. Now, as you rightly said, as teacher, you know, I'm an old school teacher. I could walk into a class with a textbook and probably start my lesson. But now the situation was different. I had to understand technology. And that was a huge challenge. And as you rightly pointed out that, yes, it was not an easy journey for us when we had to take up these online classes and actually be teaching from behind a screen. Mm -hmm. It was a huge challenge. But of course, we decided to take the bull by the horns and we did it. And so the learning goes on uninterrupted. Yes. And as far as judging goes, it is happening probably. But I don't think we need to focus there. As teachers, our focus is still our students. And I'm glad that I have the opportunity to continue teaching. And thanks to the technology that we are provided it, being in the privilege uh, segment, we can say that, yes, it saddens me that, you know, this doesn't reach out to everyone because as a teacher and a mentor, I want that everyone stays educated, but that is not happening. And that's very unfortunate because 
again, education needs to be seen as a basic need, not a luxury. So that bit always saddens me as a teacher. But at the same time, I'm happy that I'm able to take my online classes. See, other thing that why mental health of students because in all of this somewhere we ignore that what about the mental health of the students when we see online class so here also the teachers play a very important role so what even if we are online our children are there we're visible to them and i think we need to them encourage them to give their feedback and ensure that there is that comfort level and somewhere the mental balance is also maintained because we see around us depression, we see the social isolation, thanks to social distancing, there's social isolation also happening. So these are some of the challenges for us as teachers. And I think we need to take that into effect. And when we walk into a classroom, yes, ensure that that is also taken care of along with the learning. And the learning here, the focus now is all on the skills, not just the scores. Because as someone has rightly said, skills is what you need to build, not a resume. Because a resume will get you the dream job you want. But the skills is what will keep you in that job. And so now our focus as teachers is to ensure that we impart those skills. And we'll keep doing that. And Someday we'll have probably the upper hand also on technology. True, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm sure you're already very close to that. Every teacher is close to that. I'm quite sure, uh, you know, I was talking to Sugandha, ma'am, yesterday about how uh, I saw this entire process with all the schools we are associated with Pan India, how everybody started crawling in April. They were walking by May and now they're running a, a marathon <laughs> in July. And I'm sure this is the case with every teacher as well. Uh, learning how to manage our class learning how to engage a class, learning how to intrigue a class has been a learning process for everybody. Absolutely everybody, even us involved in the extracurricular learning of students. So in fact, I'd like to ask the student, everybody is a learner in this process, educationally and even otherwise, but the most evident learner in this process is Atharva Shitole with us on the panel discussion here today. Atharva, you tell me, what do you think about uh, learning in COVID-19? What has it meant to you? Uh, just share your views. Just share your views. I'll leave the question very open-ended. Okay. So, um, with special reference to this particular situation, I'm actually reminded of a quote. In the midst of chaos, there's always an opportunity. And this opportunity has led to millions of students and teachers across the world actually exploring technology and seeing it as a viable alternative to traditional classroom education. I mean, as a student of CBSE, who would have thought an academical career curriculum like CBSE and ICSE could be taught in a virtual medium, right? So um, as a student who's actually undergoing this particular experience, right? At first, I was extremely curious as to how in this education, how will this traditional mode of education that we are so familiarized with, how will they switch to an online medium? Will the classes still be intriguing? Will the learning outcomes be achieved? And will we, have, will we be having productive discussions in class like we usually do in traditional classrooms? So one sphere that I felt is most important in this era of online education is self-discipline. The student has to have that minimum self-discipline to pay attention in all of his classes. And no matter how much the teacher will try to push the child, it is finally up to that particular child to actually pay attention in class and actually respond to the teacher. I'm pretty sure my mom will probably feel the same. And um, one more sphere that I would actually have talked about is the development of skills. So we are all familiarized with the impartment of education in a very traditional manner, right? But one more sphere of learning that I was introduced to, so I'm an avid debater, I'm an avid mano. The fact that innovation could be used in actually organizing online debates, it's absolutely spectacular. You can combine your resources, you can have discussions with students all around the world. And this is something that I was really impressed by. I had no idea that this would probably be able to happen, right? Having your thoughts, discussing your thoughts, sharing your thoughts with students all around the world, and actually debating about a lot of issues. And who would have thought, like, um, for instance, this panel discussion. Normally, panel discussions are something that are very tangible in nature. They happen on the stage. There's a huge audience listening. Who would have thought this particular panel discussion could be happening on a platform like Facebook Live, wherein we have so many viewers actually viewing this. So in this 
this era of social distancing, I feel that online education is absolutely very important. And um, when we talk about the digital divide, the 66% of the students that actually do not have access. So I believe that one way that we can actually tackle this is through investment. So one good thing that I felt about India is that we have access to very cheap and high quality data services, even cheaper than other developed nations in the world. How the problem is not the internet itself, it's the accessibility of the internet. It's the basic hardware that's required to access the tech. So here, this is where the government will come into play and actually invest. And what is education? If you take it from an economic perspective, it is basically human capital formation. And this digital poverty is standing in the way of India becoming a $5 trillion economic powerhouse by the, by the year 2025. That's what many experts are also saying. So I feel that to tackle this digital divide, investment from the government is the most important. So true, so true, Atharva. Thank you so much for actually shedding light on so many other aspects beyond your learning in a classroom. You talked about soft skill development. You talked about the existence of an entire extracurricular ecosystem with debates, panel discussions taking place online. You talked about human capital. You talked about accessibility. So thank you so much. We've actually heard uh, the opening statements and initial views from all the panelists. I would now like to pose a few questions. Uh, you know, when we talk about the concept of online learning, I come from Mumbai. I am in Mumbai at the moment. I've been born and brought up in Mumbai. Uh, so I understand, you know, uh, certain trials and tribulations associated with dealing with huge populations or staying with huge populations, going into local trains at all points in time. And I can tell you with absolute conviction that when we talk, talk about the concept of social distancing, I firmly believe that it's a very privileged concept. Uh, we are very, very fortunate to be able to socially distance and you know have our own space in our houses to have this kind of a panel discussion. But if you go to Dharavi, I was saying this yesterday during the case study as well, you have six people living in a 12 by 12 chawl and then you talk about social distancing, I think it's a little difficult. And I think the exact same applies to online learning as well. We talked about certain statistics, we talked about 67% uh, students not having access to online learning. In fact, 24% of households in rural areas are the only section of society who have an internet connection at home, 42% in urban areas. Uh, and uh, in fact, these numbers drop further when you go to specific sections of the country. So it is uh, definitely a concept that is still growing. And what I'd actually like to tell you very interestingly is you'd be very surprised to know that uh, when we talk, to, talk about the whole concept of online learning, when we talk about the entire concept of being ready for pandemic-induced education, one of the countries that was most prepared for it is probably a country that most of us have not heard about before. The World Economic Forum mentioned that it's Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone and Kenya are, are the countries that are most prepared, that were most prepared for pandemic-induced learning. And the primary reason for this is that they have faced other epidemics like Ebola. You know, they are facing continuous civil war. So in fact, organized learning in schools has not been possible over sustained periods, especially for girls. So they have a range of systems, right from paper-based learning to WhatsApp-based learning, to radio, to television, which is being incorporated. And in fact, you know, they didn't take much time to actually transition into, in fact, some of these countries, unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, did not even need to transition into online learning. They already were learning online. So we are now going to the next question of beyond COVID-19. Um, I would actually like to ask you, Sumer, sir, how do you believe this will actually re result in the digitalization of education? I believe that will probably open out more avenues for more learning for more students who don't have accessibility even to government schooling. How do you believe that certain facets can be incorporated both into developed and great schools like EIS and other government schools in general? I, I would first of all, just if you allow me, mention, uh, you know, what Maya said, that well-being of teachers and well-being of students is something that we must really look at more seriously. Uh, I tell you, it's not been such a problem in India. Even though youngsters are social animals, they're not used to being cooped up at home, they're missing their friends, they're wanting to be able to get connected. But the teachers, and I'm uh, involved with teachers in, in maybe over 100 countries, uh, India has performed much better than outside. And all the reports I'm getting from principals of schools and directors of schools abroad, they are having a major problem getting the teachers to work as hard as they are having to work now and to upgrade themselves. The Indian teachers have done it beautifully. 
you know, they, they've really, uh, they're working way beyond the number of hours that they used to work. And, and they're doing it quite, quite willingly. So this is an advantage we have. But yes, it is to answer your question, this is going to uh, continue. Uh, more and more people are going to have to have accessibility to the uh, to digital learning. And it is something which is going to go hand in hand with physical classrooms even after they reopen. But my, my concern here is that the government, and not just the central government, but the governments in various states, have really shocked us. They have no, no priority for learning. They have no priority for schools. They have no priority for teachers or for students. I mean, it is really uh, very disappointing to see uh, governments uh, saying that parents should not pay fees. I mean, we look at Gujarat, where they are saying uh, parents should not pay fees. Teachers should be given full salaries. Children cannot be asked to leave because they don't pay fees. Now, this is a populist move. This is, this is vote politics. And they know that parents are going to go, teachers are going to go, schools are going to go to courts. And they hope that the courts will sort everything out. But where is the direction that they are giving? They are giving a direction to parents which is going to be harmful to the student in the sense that if I as a student keep hearing my parents talking against the school and, and the whole education system, how am I going to respect, how am I going to respect my teachers and my school? Let's face it, 70% of a school's income goes on salaries. Now you either cut those salaries or you remove the teachers. In Haryana alone, from private schools, one lakh teachers have been told to go home. Their jobs are over. There are a number of schools which are closing down because they can no longer afford to run. So I, I, I really am, am surprised that the government, that the politicians are hoping that the courts will sort things out, but they carry on with their populist politics. This is really of concern. What Atharva said, that government should be pumping money into, into digital learning. They should be giving a wider platform to people who can't afford it. I think that is very important. What he said is, is absolutely correct. So how do we get the government? They don't even, it's not even mentioned. They, there's not, no concern shown by any chief minister or any, or the prime minister or the education minister on what is happening in the country. So salute to the private schools, salute to the teachers, and salute to the resilience of the students who have actually responded so well to online learning. It's never going to stop now. It's going to go hand in hand with physical classrooms. That's the question you asked me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for actually shedding light on a lot of aspects of populist measures, populist opinion, populist discourse that is taking place, apart from the fact that, yes, digital learning is going to get integrated and the effort that our Indian teachers have made in spite of so many trials and tribulations beyond the classroom and naughty students like Atharv. So, uh, <laughs> so definitely, definitely, sir. Thank you so much for that. In fact, uh, the right to education and different articles of the Indian Constitution talk about equity and equality in education. It is, to some extent, a rather universal perception among the intellectual sections of society that the government has interpreted this as no online learning due to the inability to incorporate it into government schools. That goes beyond the populism as well. Dr. Mohit Dubey, may I please request you to share your views on this and, you know, what do you think the government should be doing i do know that uh, you know uh, we are in this situation as well at this point in time so look you know first things first uh, you know when 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 the when the country faced with this whole healthcare crisis you know uh, there was a it was a drive from atal innovation mission to request all the innovators of this country to put together the proposals for uh, uh, the, the solutions proposal that we could deploy in three to six months in this country. Suddenly, uh, the, the, the country realized that around 70 to 80% of the APIs, you know, API is an active pharmaceutical ingredients based on which any medicine can be made, are imported in this country. We realized that around 80% of our 
health infrastructure, you know, the, the ventilators, the beds and, and the sensors and, uh, you know, all those health tech equipments, you know, the hardware that is required in our hospitals, around 85% was being imported. And that's why you saw all that drive for Atmanirbha Bharat Abhiyan and, you know, that drive to uh, uh, make sure that we are able to self-sustain in the longer, longer uh, uh, run in this country. Besides that, you know, we all understand the challenges that uh, Dr. Somerji nicely pointed out and a uh, uh, lot of the governments are aware of it. But situation is that a country of 1.3 billion, you know, if you look at the kind of, see governments run on tax money, taxpayers money. And we all complain that we pay our taxes because we are salaried employees, right? But then a lot of businessmen get away with the taxpayers kind of thing, you know, without paying the due tax that is due, you know, due with those, those uh, earners. But if you look at the RBI's today's report, right? It said that the kind of NPS that are going to happen now in this country would take India 20 years back, right? So the, the, the capacity to invest from the own generation in the domestic economy, we are still a $2.7 trillion economy, sure. right? And mostly based on import. There is no home market for any of these things. I was looking at this um, uh, band 59 apps, you know, people were getting crazy about this whole thing. But please understand, all these TikToks of the world, they don't generate any revenue from India. The entire India's market spend on ad spend on the online is only two to $3 billion. That's it. Out of total 12 to $13 billion yearly uh, marketing spend, online ad spent on these apps kind of thing is only two to $3 billion. So you don't really need to go crazy gungo about all of these uh, uh, things. So for the government's priority, you know, as, as you know, we, we, you know, we were hearing Dr. Sumer about deploying the resources, you know, there are uh, uh, major issues with, reg with regards to the overall education system. You know, education falls into the concurrent list. You know, right. it's not central government, it's not just the state government. So it's true, a, true. it falls into the concurrent list. So it needs to be coordinated. And there are around 19 plus boards in this country. True. If NCRT says that every board should follow this standardized curriculum, you start hearing a lot of voices because of that uh, issue that vote bank politics, uh, you know, I need to have a 20% of my history, a state's right. history, then the other state's history and the language issues is all we all know about it. Thank you so much for actually sharing. Now, your other, other getting into that issues part, you know, let me right. try to spend a few minutes on uh, what the solution could be. So there are three aspects or three phases the way we look at it. You know, BC and BC is not before Christ, it's before COVID, right? There was a BC era, there is a, a DC era, which is during COVID and God knows when we'll see the uh, AC era of after COVID. So BC, BC era, we all understand what were the challenges and the offline uh, media was happening. Let me first focus on the DC part of it, you know, the, during COVID era. Most of this learning is uh, uh, happening on online. So there is going to be a phenomenal ex, uh, you know, expenditure on building these solutions from these startups, whether governments fund them or does not fund them. They will still be done during this uh, crisis. Mbibe, for, let me just tell you, Mbibe is a startup yeah. which does a, a individual, you know, personalized learning kind of thing. They just rate 500 CR from Reliance. My friend who heads uh, Simply Learn, they, they have been doing fantastically well. Baiju's have phenomenally gone ahead. So as, as I said, you know, removing or, or, or moving from a school brick and mortar to schooling on an online mode is happening right now in this country. Going forward, three trends that I see. The learning would always be blended learning going forward. It will never be either online or offline. The second, we all of our student base have been uh, 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 attuned to do a uh, synchronous learning, right? A teacher goes, walks up into the class, and then every student learns the same thing in the class. And you go from chapter one to chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, and you try to close it, close the subject and the syllabus. So that is going to change. The learning is going to be asynchronous in nature. And I think Atava just kind of touched upon that briefly, that because I'm a, I'm a smart student, so why should I uh, uh, wait for the teacher to complete that uh, whole chapter five first to get to the chapter six? If I'm smart enough, I can start learning that chapters, you know, as fast as I, so the pace of learning would uh, vary, start varying. Third part that we, we see the trend going forward would be the cost of acquiring those skills and the, the knowledge and the degree that you, you have to pay. 
with the advent of technology it has changed world over entire businesses have have reduced the cost if you have noticed recently last week only google announced 100000 scholarships wherein they said students just log on to the coursera platform they just have to pay 500 dollars and google employees google employees would teach them so a lot of these technology companies they are getting into this whole game of uh, uh, you know providing the education for the next generation and they are get you know and they are treating these uh, two months eight weeks uh, certificates equivalent to a four year degree from any us universities right so what Absolutely. that means is that the cost of acquiring a degree would sure, reduce sir. drastically as we build on the it infrastructure true sir thank you so much actually dr mohit duve for sharing your views on this we are actually getting a very, uh, a set of very interesting questions from all our audience on facebook live we have a huge audience watching on facebook live as well before i go into those questions we have a little bit of time left uh, you know we've had a great discussion lot of great views coming from everybody um, so we are going to you know move a little faster now to ensure that uh, we don't fall short on time towards the end as well i would like to ask mr malla and uh, uh, miss swati matha uh, with respect to learning you have seen your children learn what are the facets that you would like to ensure i would like to start off with aditya sir what would you like continuing moving forward beyond covid 19 uh you know what uh, like we said we just you know in this in this covid era which is which is a crisis mode we did what we could immediately to address the situation that came in front of us but i think what will need to be done is to get back to the education side of it again learning is definitely you know a continuing process but uh the whole aspect of education which includes life skills which includes sports which includes peer generated learning is something that that you know will have to be incorporated back uh, at some stage uh, sports has a great role to play in the overall development of the child and uh, you know one of those things uh, that that will need to be you know when we're talking about blended learning in some form or the other we will have to uh, look at that uh, aspect uh, very quickly the second thing i i i noticed some best practices coming in from one of the developed uh, countries you know and we should definitely not fall into the trap of copying what the developed world is doing to cope with this in our context but at the same time you know what it does is basically it, it uses one of the uh, abundant resources that our nation has so what what uk has done is they have recruited the help of fresh graduates or undergraduate students to reach out to uh, junior students to close the gap between the online learning and the personalized coaching right and even if you look at the current unemployment situation which you know as as per last statistic available with us is about 14% uh, you know through this covid uh, 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 crisis um if we were to look at a solution uh, and not wait i mean with, with due respect to dr mohit uh, dube you know not wait really for the government to do something about it if we were to kind of recruit the help of these available resources uh, and and get them to close this gap in the personalized coaching because that synchronized coaching aspect like you said uh, dr dube you know was a different environment and the children are, are definitely learning the, the the concepts are going through but they have immediate doubts they have immediate uh, uh, situations their own imagination that there's a there's a bias of their own that that they incorporate while learning so that needs to be that bridge i think needs to be closed and uh, we could use resources available within our country in the current context and and uh, skillfully and productively employ those resources to close the education gap so on one side i'm talking about the sports the physical activities to prevent long term damage to their health and the second side i'm saying is that the personal contact closing the gap you know as we call in our business the last mile connectivity between the the teacher and the and the students is closed by these uh, community based uh, you know uh, teaching experts who are basically fresh graduates or undergraduates for that matter thank you so much thank you so much uh, mr mala really great insights with respect to a lot of different facets of online learning synchronous learning learning through private coaching swati ma'am your boisterous 7 year old child what do you think he should continue doing online post covid 19 on a lighter note um yeah one of the reasons why we choose uh, school and not home schooling is that you know the kids when they go to school it's a very overall growth that they get there also the social skills the emotional skills and not just the education that happens you know in the school so um i personally feel that the school the physical school and online classes have to go hand in hand 
it cannot replace one and uh, replace each other and uh, definitely yeah all right thank yeah. you so much thank you so much ma'am in fact uh, anybody willing to ask wanting to ask questions we have a barrage of questions so mayor sir you have uh, you're laden with questions in fact and i will get to them one by one uh, all the other panelists as well there are a lot of different questions that are coming our way i have a question to ask atharva one of our audience members has asked, actually asked this as a student of class 12 are you not worried that no physical school will hamper your preparation for the board exams atharva all right so uh, with special emphasis on the curriculum right the cbse curriculum there's both a theory aspect to it as well and a practical aspect as well is my mom knows so let's take the example for chemistry examination we both we have a theory paper as well and we also have to conduct certain practicals right so with the current technology that we have at this very instant i feel that to cover that theory aspect of it to actually reproduce information on a piece of paper i feel that that is adequately covered in this Uh, technological setup of education however what i'm worried about more is the practical aspect of it wherein a student has to he has to conduct those experiments wherein a student has to go up and give a speech so these particular aspects i believe that the advent of technology has not encapsulated these particular aspects so sure, there might be technologies such as virtual reality to actually you know incorporate these particular aspects but again i feel that the feasibility aspect of that will also come into play so with respect again to reemphasize with respect to the theory aspect of it i feel that it's very adequately covered on this online setup but i am a bit worried about the practical aspect of it as well thank you so much atharva thank you so much uh, maya ma'am an interesting question has come your way and it's very difficult to define this in quantitative terms but i'm sure you are way more qualified than most of us apart from sameer sir of course are you convinced as a teacher that children are learning enough on the online platform well a very good question indeed and this is what i keep questioning myself let me tell you that that are my children learning enough because it is very difficult to fathom this especially when you're sitting on the other side of the screen and uh, it's very difficult to know whether each child sitting there is learning or whether that child is even there you know that's a question also because this is like an online uh, uh, platform you don't have the videos on because half the times probably the cameras are not working or it's out of choice that they keep it off uh, so it is difficult it is difficult to know whether the learning is happening but having said that again it is up to the teacher to ensure that it happens so if a teacher is equipped enough if she is convinced enough that yes she is going into that classroom to be with her children which is a replacement right now for a physical classroom setup then i think it is possible because this situation we are in we have not come here out of choice something that's thrown on us so we have to face it right so we can go that extra mile and get make it happen but that question will always remain yes sure. i guess it will always remain a question thank you so much uh, dr sumit singh a very interesting question has actually come your way um, there is a parent i believe who is asking that you know considering the uncertainty associated with reopening of schools do you believe that online education should continue and should actually be announced for a specific duration of time at the minimum so that uh, you know parents can be more prepared students can be more prepared teachers can be more prepared do you believe that would be a good idea you know let's assume that we have a vaccine by october but you know we can also assume that we might not have an, a vaccine by april do you think it's a good idea to announce the rest of the year as an online education year i don't think anyone knows when this is going to end right. it's not going to end soon that's for right. sure right uh so speculation can be there on various grounds right but what i do know is that once the schools reopen mm -hmm. all children are not going to come back to school so right. schools are going to have to carry on with some online teaching in any case mm -hmm. so it's going to be a phased uh, transition parents are not all going to be comfortable sending their kids to schools uh, we are talking about boarding schools we are talking about day schools we are talking about schools in the middle of the cities so depending on the situation in a particular area 
So this is something which we can't predict. But what uh, we, as as uh, people who keep discussing amongst ourselves, uh, we don't think anything is going to open before November. Uh, this is our guess. It's not not uh, fact. Uh, and so we are all planning according to that. Yes. And so the academic programs, because it's very important to have not just academics, but so much else. So true. So, you know, so I, I can't answer that question. I, I wish I could, but I'd be God sure, if I sir. could. Sure, sir. I was just putting you in the spot, but I understand that, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, no prime minister can ensure safety and security across the world today. So, I mean, yeah. for educationists to be even, uh, you know, uh, surmising something of that sort is very difficult. Uh, so there are a range of questions. There are at least five or six different sets of questions which can be summarized as the same thing in my opinion. Uh, you know, there's somebody who's asked whether Dr. Singh is online learning here to say, is online learning a boon or a bane? Do you think students are actually learning? And I believe, sir, you have already covered this very effectively through the course of your uh, different uh, statements. But uh, would you, uh, I believe, I, I, from whatever I can see, a lot of parents actually want, uh, you know, that level of, uh, you know, probably secondment from your end. So what do you believe? Do you think learning is actually taking place? Is online learning a boon or a bane? Uh, just for the parents, sir, would you like to reiterate? See, let me tell you that <laughs> many years ago, in the mid-80s, I was given permission by the head of the Boon School as a young teacher to conduct classes for 100 students of class 6 and 100 students of class 7 without a classroom, without textbooks, and without a subject teacher. And the kids enjoyed it. The results were excellent because the people examining were the people who were against it. And they did. So, you know, whether it is in the classroom or whether it is outside the classroom, whether it is online learning, that is not the issue. The issue is, does the child want to learn? And if the child wants to learn, online learning is a fantastic way of going in this COVID-19 era when there is no other option. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. In fact, if I, if I, if I might just add to that, um, I actually studied at Cornell University and Zoom was actually being used as a form of learning even back then. Zoom back then was way more primitive than it is today. Way, way more primitive. There was nothing like, you know, talking two ways at the level that it is taking place today. Uh, but yes, you know, online learning was so important for us back at Cornell University. It exposed us to so many wonderful professors, educationists, ways of learning, forms of learning. I was introduced to pedagogy as a concept thanks to online learning. So yes, it might have its limitations. Uh, for example, Atharva cannot throw, I'm sorry, Atharva, you're the student here, so I'm taking you as an example. Atharva cannot throw a paper ball at uh, his best friend sitting on the first bench. And yes, there is a lack of human interaction at a physical physical level that it does exist, but at the same point in time, it does open up a lot of forays. In fact, at a soft skill level, if I might mention this, I've done a very heavy research on this with a couple of professors at Cornell University. And, you know, the entire process of speaking to crowds of people, you know, getting out of the shell becomes way easier via a platform like Zoom or Team as compared to, you know, speaking live on stage because you have the ability to speak to a crowd while actually still looking at yourself alone. So yes, there are many, many positives associated and Dr. Sumer Singh has really talked about it at a very holistic level as well as specific level, taking an example from his own life back uh, as a teacher, uh, Doon School, uh, you know, talking about that as well. In fact, Swati, ma'am, there's a question that's actually come your way too. Uh, COVID-19 is not going anywhere at least for six to eight months or till we have a vaccine. In simple words, would you want the online classes to continue? And in simple words, actually the parent has been very clear about it. In simple words, do you want them to continue or do you want to, you know, just prefer uh, uh, probably putting your child into a couple of classes online outside of school? Um, no, personally, definitely, I agree that online classes did make a lot of difference. It creates a structure of, for the entire day that, okay, eight o'clock is my morning time. Then I have to do some uh, warm-up exercises. Then I have maths and I have science, you know, the, the day follows. Um, well, I really cannot say because, in, uh, I mean, luckily in Malaysia, the schools uh, will be opening up, the physical schools are opening up and things are much better here. So. We haven't thought much about it, but we did have online classes for two months. And I think definitely it makes more sense to have classes than to just let them be on their own. 
Thank you so much. In fact, Mr. Malla, uh, somebody has asked you whether you're convinced that your child will be able to perform in her boards as she is not really attending live school. Oh, well, uh, it's a matter of perspective. Um, and I look at it from a slightly different uh, aspect. I look at it from a person who is soon going to be entering the workforce, right? What do I want to see four years from now? I want to see a person who's shown resilience, who's shown fortitude, who's battled through the odds and come out a winner. The marks in the boards are one aspect of it. And I, I truly mean it when I say this, you know, it might sound cliched, uh, but marks in the board exams are, are, are going to reflect only one aspect of the of the person's uh, abilities and capabilities, but you know, really, how well the person is able to contribute to society and community is good. I think sir is. I think sir is facing a slight network issue, uh, but uh, depend upon how the person uh, who are going to be far more successful, far more successful. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for your yeah. views. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Dupe, there is a question that's come to you. And the question is a yes or no question. Uh, interestingly, the parents are very specific about how they want the questions answered. It is a yes or no question. Uh, the question is, do you think that the government is doing enough for online learning? Oh, looks like they're, they're still tagging me as a government person, right? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just uh, say a few words because I, I think what Atharva made, you know, uh, pointed out, uh, let me first tell you this. See, th there's no question about you can debate endlessly whether online is real, offline is real, is it good, bad, there's no end to that. But what I invite these youngsters, like Atharva, to find the solutions in this case of crisis. Can we be the solution provider? Can we on the part that after 20 years down the line, can these youngsters say, I was part of the problem that was forced upon me, but I came out victorious as a solution provider. And just to highlight to what he mentioned as a problem of uh, uh, you know, practical aspects, this is given to us that we are forced to sit in our houses, but there is a concept of virtual labs. Eight IITs and some other institutions of this country have come together and created virtual labs. So you can actually rip apart a basic physics cup, a practical and go step by step, learn from chemistry ka step by step. But then what I'm saying is that's for the higher education. These kids who are still in schools, I'm saying that they can learn the tricks of creating these small practicals themselves and can offer an alternate solution that the world can look at how the, uh, uh, you know, these youngsters of this country can provide solution during this crisis also. So uh, uh, online, offline, let's not get into that debate. Whatever is Whatever has happened to us is has happened. Can we you know, assemble our resources together? Can we put our brains to that? And can we be known as the solution provider to come, come, you know, to take this whole education paradigm to a new level when the world starts settling down? And we, we, we you know, we, we can say that our kids provided this solution despite all those challenges. Thank you so much, Dr. Dubey. Thank you so much. In fact, we have had a range of very interesting questions for all members of the panel. And we have had very interesting discussions covering so many different perspectives, right from the perspective of continuity in education, to accessibility of education, to building human capital, to the economic divide and the educational divide. This is actually a new concept, which you know we will probably study um, in uh, economics books probably 10 years down the line. It's going to take 10 years probably to actually understand the tangible effect that a gap in a year of education has caused to the Indian economy because it is definitely, unfortunately, going to be very big. All of us have been able to address the importance of online learning during the era of COVID-19 and have also been able to appreciate certain facets which can be continued moving forward. Uh, Mr. Malla interestingly talked about, you know, the entire aspect of dealing with adversity for students, making them more life ready. Uh, interestingly, the De Department of Industrial Planning and Promotion states that only 27% of India's graduates are considered employable in spite of having first class degrees all over the place and the absence of soft skills is probably one of the primary reasons for this. I hope that uh, the era of COVID-19 has made students more life ready. Maya ma'am has of course so, so succinctly mentioned how teachers have become so digitally education ready. Uh, 
I think at this point in time, every teacher in India deserves a huge round of applause. They have had to face a lot of issues. Uh, of course, Elpro International School, Chinswad is a great school and I know everything that they do for teachers and there are many other schools of this sort, a lot of IPSC schools that Sumer Singh sir is also associated with, I'm sure. But you know, there are so many schools across India. In fact, schools that I know have, which have probably slashed off, uh, you know, close to 70% salaries, 90% salaries and teachers are working all over the place over time, you know, with probably small houses at times, having to accommodate places, finding that small corner where they can conduct a class for a huge group of students, keeping them under control, managing household chores in the absence of external help. It's really been a very, very troublesome period for teachers, for nurses. All of these people are frontline workers. And I believe that irrespective of online learning or no online learning, it's very important to understand the sacrifices that they are making financially, personally, and at times, even with respect to their self-respect, to make sure that learning is continuing. So it's, I think, a very important uh, takeaway from COVID-19. Uh, the fact that, you know, teachers are always going to be there, learning is always going to be there. And, you know, I love Zig Ziglar and a very interesting statement that he made when I was actually making my notes for this panel discussion is that he said that if you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. But if you're determined to learn, no one can stop you. No one can stop you. And I am sure this applies to so many wonderful students like Atharva, Swati Ma'am's boisterous seven-year-old child, and a range of other students all across the country who actually are dying to go back to classrooms, but also understand that in the absence of a live classroom, we need to make sure a live Zoom session is the most holistic learning experience. From my perspective, as an educationist myself working in the field of soft skill development, I have seen how students have adapted, how my own trainers have adapted, how I have adapted, how everybody across the ecosystem is adapting, parents are adapting to learning. And I'm sure that you know one of the worst things that we can do as uh, a population who has faced the worst pandemic in uh, the 2000s is the worst thing that we can do is probably not take away the positive facets from COVID-19. It is a bubble which will unfortunately, which will fortunately, I hope, I'm so sorry. It's a bubble which I fortunately, I hope no other generation has to see at least for the next 500 years. But you know, it has opened up so many opportunities. Dr. Dube talked about those opportunities uh, with respect to digital learning, you know, um, analogous to the banking boom, the digital banking boom. And I hope that we make the most of this. I know schools are going to make the most of this. A lot of schools have invested a lot of resource into making things work. So I would like to, uh, you know, wish everybody all the very best. And I hope COVID-19 ends very soon. And we go into the beyond COVID-19 era at the earliest. Uh, there are a lot of vaccines, a lot of, uh, you know, there's the vaccine war, like there was a war for, uh, you know, first atom bomb with the Manhattan Project prior to World War II, during World War II. I hope that we are able to get this vaccine at the earliest, whether it's Oxford or, you know, uh, Bharat Biochem or anybody else. Because, you know, I, like every other teacher, I'm longing to actually go back and actually make sure that I have that direct interaction with students in a classroom. Dr. Sumer Singh has gone through all eras of education at this point in time in contemporary India. And I'm sure he would also second the same thing. And it is my honest request as well to uh, government departments uh, to be supportive. Uh, this is a very, very troublesome period for every teacher, for every student, for every parent. And at this point in time, it's very important to help with the process of learning, with the process of education. So thank you so much, everyone. And I would like to extend a vote of thanks to every member of today's panel discussion. I would have loved to keep this discussion going, but uh, I believe that Suganda ma'am has mentioned that there are certain limitations. And of course, uh, we have already extended the session beyond 15 minutes uh, for 15 minutes more. And it's been a very wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Maya ma'am, for providing your views as a teacher. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here. And just, just one thing that I want to convey that at least during this pandemic time, we don't need to pressurize our children. Parents, please don't do that. There's no need to take any kind of pressure or pass on any pressure to anyone. Let's all be in a very happy space where happy learning is happening. That's all I want to say. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Thank Sumer Singh. You. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. Uh, having views of a veteran educationist like you have uh, has also, you know, really uh, provided a lot of food for thought to parents. So you would be amazed with the number of questions that have come your way. I've just tried to summarize all of them. May I, may I make one statement? Please, please, sir. Please, please. Go yeah, ahead. Okay. I just want to remind uh, parents that uh, if you look at the independent studies done by Harvard University, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, 
they talk about your success in career depends 75 to 80% on your soft skills so that is something which you can easily develop at home concentrate on that because those are very important for the future of your child thank you thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you so much dr dubey for joining us providing us with a world view from the perspective of technology development incubation and of course human capital thank you so much sir thank you so much for joining us thank you it was lovely having uh, uh, you know being learning so much here with the you know esteemed panelists and especially the youngsters mm -hmm. i i just appeal to them that enough damage has been done to this country now it's your turn to provide the solutions not just for 1.3 billion people but for the entire community which is around 7 billion people please step up to the place and this country is there behind you the mentors all these mentors on the panel are there to support you with any kind of guidance that you need these are some super mentors that are available to you so please rise up to the occasion and provide solutions for the 7 billion people to help the community thank you Thank you so much, Doctor Dubey. Mr. Mala, thank you so much for joining us. Such wonderful perspectives as a parent, as a professional, you've provided us. You've talked about you know burning issues. You've gone beyond you know the picture of you know your uh, your daughter actually attending sessions at EIS. You've talked about the entire aspect of continuity. You've talked about so many other aspects which are so important to really address. Thank you so much, Mr. Mala, for joining us. My pleasure, Tari. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati, ma'am. Thank you so much for sharing your views all the way from Malaysia, talking about how it was to, you know, be a part of the entire process of education at more direct levels with your seven-year-old child, and you know, helping him out with the few assignments that you probably have as well. I'm sure it's been an enriching, enhancing, and engaging experience for you. I just wanted to say that we are a generation of almost like a bulldozer parent, where we try to remove all the obstacles for our kids so that the kids can have the best of the things possible. Let's not do that anymore, and let's not do the work for them. Let them also learn more, and not not stress about if they're learning enough through the process. This is also kind of a learning surviving in a pandemic. <laughs> absolutely absolutely in fact there was a very interesting statement that i read by one of my favorite uh, educationists henry juru um, i love uh, the educationist uh, one of the most uh, path breaking educationists um, and he stated uh, in very literal terms he said the biggest the biggest gift that a parent can give to his child or her child is to make sure that the parent is not the child's biggest punishment <laughs> that's very true right so uh, Thank you so much for that, Atharva. I think you have impressed everybody on the panel. You have impressed all audience members with your ability to provide such a world view, such a balanced view. Thank you so much for joining us, Atharva, and uh, I am sure that a very bright future beckons. Thank you so much. I would just like to end with a quote by Nelson Mandela: "Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, and I'm pretty sure the youth of today will change the world tomorrow." thank you so much thank you so much atharva and you know uh, i need to give a big shout out i need to actually extend my vote of thanks to the school the management of the school so ganga ma'am amrita ma'am everybody else who's been a very active process of making equest a reality to be honest there are not many schools in india who take the risk of having a discussion on online learning with parents students teachers and <laughs> a range of other educationists today it's a very sensitive topic all over the place whether you talk about fee or you talk about you know whether it's actually learning taking place and government is not doing uh, too many favors to any school it's probably you know doing a number on each one of them at this point in time as well so to be able to have that level of conviction in your services in your ability to deliver via the online platforms and to have the confidence that you and your fraternity including teachers students parents is running in this phase of covid-19 and to be able to have this honest discussion where we have talked about a lot of burning concepts a lot of burning concepts you have a parent on uh, the panel as well you have a student on the panel as well and i know the student is really outspoken so to be able to actually do this is uh, something that uh, you definitely deserve a lot of credit for and i'm sure that uh, this is going to further reinforce the level of confidence you have in your pedagogy so thank you so much suganda ma'am for having given me the opportunity to be the moderator for this session and i'd like to thank all members of the audience my sincerest apologies if we have not been able to address questions <laughs> unfortunately all of these things are timed and time and tide wait for no one i hope it moves fast with respect to our vaccine as well suganda so, ma'am would you like to say something on a parting note 
Thank you, Anand, for moderating this panel, and uh, my heartfelt gratitude to all the panelists for taking out time and uh, joining us for today's discussion. Like Anand said, it was not a very easy thing to get all the stakeholders of school learning and education come together and share their views. And I'm so glad we didn't have arguments in the panel. But uh, thank <laughs> you, everybody for being so gracious and so kind and sharing your honest perspectives on what we feel about online learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suganda. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Anand. Thank you, Suganda. Thank, thank you, you Sumerji. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, so you. Much. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And thank you, audiences, for watching us and putting in your questions. It really means a lot. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.